Good morning. This is Bill from out of Europa, Naples, on yet another muggy Florida September morning. You know, I'm always crying about how muggy and humid it is, but really, at the moment, I mean, it is epic. I don't know if it's this approaching storm. I don't know if it's, you know, some sort of concocted weather conditions or global cooling or whatever other phenomenon is going on. But I can tell you that I just don't, maybe I'm just getting older and fatter. That's, that's another distinct possibility. Uh, you know, a great friend of mine, he said it very properly. You know, we were doing a little race at Sebring last weekend. We're suiting up inside the trailer. And he said, man, this suit, it just keeps shrinking. You know, I don't know if it's the way my wife's washing it. I couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic or not, but, you know, I do share his experience. Uh, anyway, we continue uh, Jaguar Week, or what's quickly becoming Jaguar Week here at Auto Europa, with this 2000 Jaguar XKR Coupe. Uh, now, I kind of have to eat my own words that I just said yesterday, and that was that Jaguar had lost something, you know, after the, uh, the death of the XJ6 and, uh, you know, the XJS. The truth is that this is a pretty incredible car, and what makes it fantastic is that it's all Jaguar. You know, they really, in the XJ, XJS, a beautiful, beautiful car, but it is not like this. It is not, you know, akin to the E-Type. This is a much more logical successor to the E-Type, with the big swooping curves, the incredibly beautiful roof line, the uh, long, long front end, the uh, tiny little rump end, big wheels and tires, and uh, of course, being the R, it adds some extra special stuff we'll get into. So, uh, what a terrific, terrific car. This is a two-owner piece, 19,000 miles, finished in very understated metallic silver outside with gray leather inside, and uh, yeah, what a cool car. Uh, now, the R means that this thing has an Eaton Root-style supercharger under the hood, which bumps the uh, horsepower all the way up to 370. And in fact, Jaguar claimed a faster uh, acceleration time, you know, zero to 60, quarter mile, that sort of thing, than the 911 or the SL500 of the same year. And they did produce it. This thing would go zero to 60 in about 5.2 seconds. Uh, it would do a, a quarter mile in the 13s and would run all the way up to 155 miles an hour where it was governed there by a nanny that wouldn't let you go any faster. Probably aerodynamically limited after that. Lethal if you went up to 180. Uh, but, uh, you know, from the exterior, there really weren't that many styling cues to sort of, you know, accommodate the extra 15 grand you'd spend on getting an R. Uh, you've got these fantastic vents in the hood, which are twofold. One thing they do is allow air to escape underneath that tight hood. Uh, they also also release pressure on the underneath of the front end. So when the car is at speed, air blows up through the engine, out those vents, and keeps uh, keeps the front end firmer down on the pavement than it otherwise would be. One neat thing is when you're sitting there at idle, you know, after running the car, you can see heat emanating from those things. So uh, they are definitely not for show only. Uh, you also got a mesh wire grill up front uh, that distinguished it from the XK8s. You got red backed badges with a uh, supercharger logo go on them with the big cat. Uh, you got these big 18-inch uh, alloy wheels. I uh, can't remember what they're called, but they're beautiful. Ab Asteroid style, I believe. Don't know why. Re-entry, whatever it is. Also with the red badge and the red cat on the side of the fender. Uh, these were the few little things that distinguished the R's from the 8's. Uh, also that little deck lid spoiler, which, you know, one could say helps plant the rump end down, but you know, truly, it's just this sort of understated touch. Uh, big twice Twice pipes, they're actually little twice pipes, they look quite small. Uh, and, uh, you know, not a lot of chrome. So that is one thing that Jag sort of did away with in this series, and that probably offended some of the old timers. But uh, I think it looks just fine on this car. I, I think if I have any complaint about, if you hear that thing, god damn, that didn't carry me off, that bird. Uh, anyway, um, one complaint I might have had about it, you're spending the extra money to get the R. Why make it a nearly visual twin to the car that costs a lot less money and has a lot less power? I mean, give us some styling cues. You don't have to make it gaudy by putting stripes down it or, you know, some kind of big suspension type wing on the back. But, uh, you know, maybe a couple more little bits and pieces. Uh, I would say maybe the brakes. I mean, it's got very adequate, lovely brakes that work great to stop this car. I, I actually think they're the same brakes on the 8. I don't think they upgraded them or needed 
needed to. But they could have given it some kind of a treatment, uh, at least to make them look a little bit more special. Uh, that said, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous car. I mean, it is absolutely stunning. Look at that roof line. Look at the shape of the fenders. You're like Racer X from uh, Speed Racer or something. Just a, just a stunning car to behold. All right, we're gonna start inside the trunk. I have to say, you don't see many coupes. Now, the battery went dead in this little thing under my watch, so I have to replace that. But in the meantime, if you need to get in the trunk from the outside, there's a little hidden keyhole between the X and the K to pop that open. All right, so in here, in this 19,000 mile example, is what we would expect, just everything kind of mint and neat and the way it came. You see, I've got my advertising posters there uh, to uh, you know hang up in that photo booth. It's coming. It's coming. The photo booth is coming. Eh, we may have a different account. We'll see. Uh, as you can see, it has a Garmin uh, navigation drive back there, which is a good thing. Uh, you know, the Garmin makes this, even this 2000 nav is functional and useful. Uh, try using nav in a 2000 Mercedes. It'll make you want to kill somebody. A uh, little bag of tools back there. Uh, the net is still in place if you need to, you know, put your dead squirrels in there after they hang for a while. Everything lovely in the back of the trunk. Couple sets of golf clubs, no problem. Uh, just, uh, yeah, but you know, who the hell wants to go golfing when you've got 370 horsepower under the hood? Anyway, all very lovely under there. Have a look under the hood. All right, so here we have it, a four liter uh, double overhead cam V8 putting out 370 horsepower. It makes more torque uh, at the beginning of its rev curve than the 8 makes in total. Uh, total. So uh, pretty impressive stuff. Very, very quick. You see again that root style blower buried in the middle there, belt driven. Just awesome. Uh, Jaguar went with the supercharger. They said it was more, you know, smooth and low end power than a turbo. That's very true. And uh, it does make for an incredible motor. In fact, Despite how beautiful this car is, the best feature of this car is truly uh, this big V8 under the hood and how smooth it is, powerful and lovely. Uh, you know, the way uh, it can be used so delicately and, and also used like a sledgehammer. Uh, it's just a fantastic motor under the hood of this thing. Made it to a five speed from Mercedes Benz. Uh, you know, pretty incredible stuff. The world would be all better, I guess, if everyone just used the same damn five speed from Mercedes Benz and everything. But of course, it handled a lot of torque. It's a very smooth shifting transmission and uh, just a, uh, you know, a fine match for this engine under the hood. This is the same one that came from the uh, the XJR, the uh, big sedan, came out a couple years earlier and, uh, you know, put that car on the map. So uh, they had to do a few little tweaks to fit it under the hood of this thing, but basically the same engine with the same everything, putting out the same power and really moves this thing down the road pretty nice. There you see the bottom of those vents and how functional they are. Uh, it's a very cool feature, you know, to see I, all these things. You know, there's so many styling cues on cars, you know, today, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, that are just fake, and, and they're just annoying and ridiculous. Like, there's little fender holes on the Buicks. You know, we get it. You had them in the 50s, and they were great, but, uh, you know, you don't need them now unless they're going to be functional. Don't, don't just give us a tip of the hat. Give us something functional, and uh, Jaguar did with these vents on the hood. All right, have a look inside. So what you've got in here are just, you know, yards and yards of leather everywhere. Absolutely beautiful leather, lovely to sit in, lovely to feel. Uh, you've got very subdued door panels. They're two-toned, sort of gray and light gray with a little bit of carpety stuff on the bottom. Uh, just a hint, I mean, a salt and pepper throw of wood in the door. A little bit of chrome. It's got a 320-watt Alpine sound system, which sounds pretty good in here. But, uh, you know, again, very understated, very elegant, uh, this car. And that is what it's all about. This is not, you know, something you're going to drive to the strip club and, you know, look at a monster truck race or something. This is, you know, this is a very elegant night out on the town in very dapper clothing, doing nice, elegant things. So uh, that's what this car is for. Now, it does have hilariously small back seats. In fact, I can't 
back up far enough uh, with this, uh, you know, door panel here in the camera to show you too much. But I mean, let me tell you, they're tiny. You're not going to be able to fit many people in there at all. Kids are going to complain. The hell with them. Leave them at home. But uh, anyway, it does have rear seats. So if your uh, city or country or whatever has insurance regulations that say a four seat car is cheaper, you at least get to qualify for that. Otherwise, anyone you stuff back there is going to want to do a homicide. All right, the e-brake here in classic Jaguar fashion, uh, that's one of those lift, set, and then release thing. It'll go back down after it's set, so you have to push the button when you pull it back up uh, to, uh, to release it again. It's a little bit tricky, but once you get it, you got it, but it's going to befuddle some people. All right, so let's get it. I'm going to leave the door open to fire it up, although I don't think it matters. They, they put so much uh, sound insulation in this thing that you don't get the full sound of that big V8. Well, let's do it anyway. Yeah, I mean, just a hint of a menacing rumble there. The seat ball on. I God, do I need to get some air conditioning going. Let's do that. It is muggy and nasty. Okay, so here we have a three hole four gauge layout. You've got your 6,000 red line tack on the left. You've got your 170 mile an hour speed uh, speedometer in the middle. You see just 19,000 miles under that. Uh, you got your fuel and water temp over on the right. So it's essentially everything you need. Uh, the only option in this car was this in-dash Garmin nav system. Uh, if it didn't have this, then it would have three more gauges running across here. I think one of them a trip computer and then probably volts or something else. So, uh, you know, you're giving up a little bit of your sporty gauge stuff to get a pretty useful navigation system, which is fine. Oh, defrost. Lord. All right. Turn that down a minute. Uh, you also get a little trip computer up there. Great stuff. You get this beautiful wood and leather steering wheel with the stitching and your volume and phone controls, although don't bother thinking this thing has any kind of a phone you can use anymore. Uh, your cruise control over here, your headlights on that side, your wipers here. Uh, it has a, a easy entry function, which is controllable uh, by a, uh, oh, get over there, by a little round thing on the steering column. This guy here, the wheel can move up or down when you get in and out of the car. I have it set to off because I find it annoying. Uh, down here, you've got your climate control, uh, your traction control off thing if you want to uh, leave, you know, more black strips down the pavement than a Yanko Camaro. You can turn that thing off and do an NHRA-style burnout. Uh, we've got, a, again, this Alpine, uh, now, what is it, in-dash, you know, AM, FM cassette. you got a CD changer somewhere. Uh, there's some super glue or something spilled on this thing. Really annoying to me. It's driving me nuts because it looks like spilled Coke, and it looks like I should be able to get it off. But uh, we haven't been able to, so I think we're probably going to replace that uh, stereo in this little plastic bin there. <sighs> Annoying. Anyway, you got heated seats. Everything looking good there. Over here, you've got a very proper uh, glove box. We got a set of books in here. We got some records with this car. Uh, you have an enormous expanse of beautiful, rich wood facing you in the dashboard. I'm glad they resisted the urge to put in some kind of, uh, I don't know what you have, fish scale or, you know, some other kind of styling cue for the R. Even though I'm crying that they didn't make the R more distinctive, I'm glad they didn't do that by giving up on the wood because the wood's just beautiful. Uh, you've got this J shifter here, J pattern. Uh, again, with the five-speed automatic, leave it in drive. Uh, your S, that's a sport setting. Uh, it activates the computer-aided traction system or something. I can't remember that, but it, cats. You know, they had to do that. Cats. Give me a break. Uh, anyway, it, what that does is it dampens up the uh, suspension and makes it so, you know, when you're in a sporty sort of mood, it's really going to handle the, uh, you know, the, the twisties very well. When you're not, it's going to, you know, release the suspension and let you have a nice cushy ride. Uh, it actually works really, really well and uh, is another part of what makes this car such a technological achievement for Jag. Uh, what else do we have? These little bins, they work. <laughs> and that one goes immediately when I say that. All right, so we'll be replacing that little bin. Uh, it's a perfect example of Jaguar and what makes me want to, you know, freak out every time I own one. But it's done with love, so. Uh, oh, God, you got to love it. You have to love it. Here we go. 
Okay, so now, again, you know, mild-mannered. You get just this hint of blower wine from up front. Just a little hint of it. Uh, just enough to, to know that something's a little bit different about this one. Uh, but the ride, cushy, soft, nice. You get beautiful steering feedback, but, uh, you know, not too much. The, the wheel doesn't shake when you hit a bump. Uh, you know, your rump is seated in these kind of skinny seats. They could be a little more supportive, but they're comfortable. And uh, otherwise, you're just, you know, having a nice leisurely cruise to work. You can get past this pedestrian, I'll hammer it a little bit. Anyway, so everything's smooth, everything lovely. Oh, God, there's just people walking. I just don't want to torture them. All right, I'll give you that stern look. You know the one. Who's this delinquent? So anyway, there it is. <laughs> you get this instant supercharger torque. Puts you back in the seat. 370 horses come on very, very strong, as does a ton of torque. Uh, and it's just a lovely feeling to have this elegant, you know, proper, handsome coupe. Uh, almost a feminine coupe, if you will. And I don't mean it's for women. I just mean the styling, uh, the design is so... You know, I don't know. It's definitely not a sledgehammer. It's uh, it's much more curvy than that. It reminds me of the, you know, 50s and 60s racing Jags and Ferraris. Beautiful, beautiful design. But so all this elegance, all this poise, you know, and then it's got an absolute sledgehammer under the hood when you want it. And that makes this such a nice car. And in fact, it's part of what's going to make it uh, a car that goes through the auction block. Let's do that again. Is that pull nice? Uh, really, the only car that I prefer the torque curve in is the 911, and even that I could debate you on, at least when we're talking about a 2000 model. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, this thing's going to be a special car at the end. No question is this a collectible. Every Jaguar Coupe really is, uh, but this one's going to be more so because it's semi-reliable, limited production. It was expensive, supercharged, gorgeous. You know, it's just made to, uh, you know, to thrill collectors for years to come. This guy, we got to do this one more time. I just enjoy it too damn much. Can you hear that? Oh my god, is that fun! So, look, anyway, here it is 2000 Jaguar XKR Coupe, 19,000 miles, immaculate. What a fine piece, what a fine car, what an absolute joy. Uh, to drive and own and you know the maintenance just isn't that bad. It definitely isn't like the old Jags This uses all you know Bosch electronics all off-the-shelf stuff that they use in a bunch of cars I think in 2000 Jag had one of the highest uh, customer satisfaction ratings in uh, JD powers, which is a very impressive for them. So uh, Anyway, look if you have an interest give us a call 239-298-8000 on the web at aenaples.com Thank you so much for having a look. We appreciate it. I'm going to resist the urge to, uh, you know, get a ticket on the way into work. I'm going to take it calmly from here on out. But uh, we hope to see you with the next one. Take care.